Huge victories, devastating losses, and gruesomely long stays at the local Oak Motel. Welcome to the hardest Pokemon challenge ever, Pokemon Kaizo Ironmon. We are in Pokemon Fire Red, the Kanto region. The rule set is a little weird and complex, but here's a fundamental breakdown. The entire map has random Pokemon scattered. There are six dungeons in the map, including Mount Moon, Rock Tunnel, Rocket Hideout, Pokemon Mansion, Silphco, and Victory Road, which means they're only enterable once. And nine gauntlets, including eight gyms and the ever so challenging Elite Four where we can't skip a single trainer. That's 15 heart-stopping road-blocking challenges where any one bad matchup could cost us the run. And the Pokemon, an absolute beautiful mess of nonsense. Let's use Charizard as our example because that's a Pokemon. Sure, Charizard keeps its fire and flying typing as well as its mean 534 base stat total, but its ability, its learn set, random. Even the distribution of its stats is random. So we could have a lightning fast Charizard with a defense stat of 10 that melts at the first hint of rocks. And the best part, we get one Pokemon and we have to beat the entire thing. One Pokemon to beat our rival in the lab, one Pokemon to clear through Blaine's long list of guardian trainers, one Pokemon to defeat the whole Elite Four. Is it doable? Introducing Mango. Mango is a Blastoise. Not only is she a cutie, but she's also one of the best Pokemon in this game. We met Mango in the lab, and this is what she was packing. Now, I know this looks like mumbo jumbo, but let me try to explain. Blastoise has a very high base stat total, or BST, which means there are plenty of randomized stats to go around. Mango repped a high attack stat here, partnered with reasonable speed and a very strong bulk in defense. Physical moves weren't going to impact us at all, and the random move set was pretty coordinated. Two physical moves meant Mango could make the most of its massive offense. Sleep Powder, though inconsistent, seemed a promising way to navigate stressful situations. And finally, probably the most important thing about Mango, her ability. Mango had Volt Absorb, which meant she had an immunity to electric types. Being naturally a water type, Mango was only weak to grass and electric, except now one of those weaknesses was an advantage. And remember, grass types were absolute garbage in this game. The best grass move is like Leaf Blade, which does 70 BP in Gen 3. Sure. Solar Beam and Frenzy planted more, but those two turn attacks would give a chance to recover. If there's any type we're kind of okay with Mango being weak to, it's probably Grass. Nevertheless, a level 5 Blastoise with a lot of promise didn't mean anything to me. As you're about to learn, this was attempt 1667. Don't do this to me. Don't do this to me. Don't tease me like this. To be honest with y'all, I was a broken man. My optimism that I bring to my Nuzlocks was absent. Still, I walked into the rival fight ready to face off and kiss my new friend Mango goodbye. Our rival picked up a Flaffy, which obviously would typically have the type advantage. This time around, Volt Absorb had us covered. Pause. Notice that the level of Flaffy here is higher than usual. This was going to be the case for every Pokemon in the run. A 50% increase rounded up from the standard game levels. I used Sleep Powder and considered all all of the things that could end me right now. Frenzy, Plant, and Sheer Cold came to mind, though Flaffy wouldn't wake up until its third turn of sleep when it hurt itself in confusion. Mango had cleared the first major roadblock. The next big one is going to be the first trainer in Viridian. Early game was so tough in these games, and the first fight in the forest was the second toughest battle just behind the very early game king, Brock. Mango had to beat two random level 9 Pokemon while only being level 7. Fortunately, the bug catcher sent out a ball toy who went to sleep and never touched us, and a man who found a similar fate after firing off a hydro cannon. Maybe ironically, the very next trainer opened with Deoxys and something big happened. Deoxys went to sleep and fell to a couple of Mango's dizzy punches. That wasn't really a big deal. What was crazy though was the next move that Mango learned, Rock Tomb. Rock Tomb gave us ghost coverage, which meant Dusclops and Banette would be at least manageable. Maybe more importantly though, we could now kill Shedinja, the only Pokemon guaranteed to have the same ability as its standard counterpart. Shedinja coverage was a must and we had it. A few battles later and we were at Brock's door. Mango was ready and capable with an ever-expanding attack stat and a glorious moveset. The cutest Blastoise in the world was going to give Brock a shot. The rules of this gauntlet of a gym were simple. I had to fight every trainer and I could not leave until that was done. I couldn't heal outside of battle, though I could use a healing item so long as I'm willing to do it in a fight. The first trainer was on the clock and Mango looked confident. The opponent sent out a Cubone who got bopped as well as a Seedot who similarly stood no chance. Brock here has five Pokemon, all of which want me dead. He opened with a love disc who melted to a single sky uppercut. Then his next Pokemon came out. Um, this feels yucky. I don't, oh no. Oh no, well, this is fine. I missed. Okay, good. I missed again. 
Bl Blastoise, I need you to step up. What? After finally putting the dragon to sleep, we were able to dizzy punch it out of the match. Sky Uppercut would finish Lanoon and Tangela sought to end our run. Dude. <laughs> Blastoise is kind of blind, I agree. Thank you. Yeah, even a fantastic Pokemon like Mango here can find herself on the brink of elimination in just the blink of an eye. Now, unlike most of our challenges, this is one that didn't have a level cap. Early game was behind us, and this beautiful mid-game section would serve as the perfect opportunity to beef up our Water Tortoise and collect the perfect learn set. We made our way to Mount Moon, where we entered the first of what is called a dungeon. Dungeons are areas that we're only allowed to enter once, though we can skip however much we want to. Obviously, knocking out more random trainers is good here because we're able to snag more experience as we can't farm EXP on wild Pokemon. But surviving is more important than that, as we won't be able to heal in between fights. After clearing the two mandatory trainers at the end of the tunnel, we worked backwards to see how much work we could get in. Mango thrashed on the entire cave, beating every single trainer with its three moves without using any heals. We left the first dungeon level 31, which was generally a very good level to beat. Over in Cerulean, we had a major battle with our rival to take care of. Our rival here has five Pokemon. Now, if you look at our stats, you can see a little category called heals in bag. This is representative of how many items like full restores, hyper potions, and so on that we happen to be carrying at any given moment. Ground items were completely randomized, so to be sitting this low in heals at this point in the game was absolutely devastating. Five Pokemon, one heal. I thought this fight was hilarious because I was really backed into a corner. Believe. Please don't freeze me. Thank you for not freezing me. Pile of swine. Oh my god. Okay. And this comes out because it has something on me. What is it? It's flatter? Interesting. Okay. Are you gonna any day now? Dude. Sick. No heals for Mango now. We now had the go ahead to clear so many trainers while healing in between every single battle. Route 24 with Nugget Bridge, Route 25 with Bill, Route 6, and Route 11 were light work. This is the point in the game where we can start to really over level Mango and fights get super breezy. Sure, we're still dead to a quick Destiny Bond or a bulky Paris song, but both occurrences were pretty unlikely. I'm now just realizing that I completely forgot to mention the dungeon that is the SSN. The task here is to collect all of the items, defeat our rival, and then clear out as many trainers as possible on our way out. Mango throttled our rival as we collected a whole bunch of items on this boat. Because of the amount of trainers that are on this boat, PP management usually creates issues when attempting to full clear. Mango was struggling severely with small PP problems, though the 35 moves between Dizzy Punch, Sky Uppercut, and Rock Tomb proved just enough to clear the entire ship. Monster Mango had delivered the goods. We were now level 45 and heading into Misty, which felt pretty comfortable. Misty has two trainers that Mango needed to beat, which were utter pushovers. Five Misty Pokies versus one Mango. Who will prevail? Bayleaf? Clobbered. Combuskin? Melted. <laughs> you think you can you think you can hurt me crowbat watch this yeah guys if i talk smack it critical hits every time guaranteed don't believe me watch damn grovile you're trash trash garbage grovile start with the same letter for a reason i told you i told you every single time that i trash talk i get crits every time Victreeble fell as well, and our second badge was in hand. The next routes to take care of were routes 9 and 10, where a few trainers sat before Rock Tunnel. This part of the game is also a good time to try what is known as scouting Pokemon. All Blastoises in this game have the same stat spread and learn set as Mango, as do every other species of Pokemon. Getting to know the Pokemon in this particular run is an important part of planning for future difficult spots. On route 9, we met an absolute demon in Dusclop. This thing just dies. Oh my god, it survived. Don't do this to me. Please don't miss. Thank you. What's left? One Pokemon. I just have to beat. 
Grateful that was behind us, Mango kept chugging along with a complete understanding that Dusclops was officially the most lethal check to her livelihood so far. Still, with no more major issues on these routes, we paved the way back to Surge. The three trainers in this gym weren't notable, and Mango managed to behead all of Surge's team swiftly, only taking one hit from a weak Umbreon with Megahorn along the way. Posterized like Kendrick Perkins in 2012, Surge couldn't keep pace and was left behind. Rock Tunnel awaited a place that promising runs are known for collapsing in. Mango was still adorable and the nicest of a friend, but from everything I knew about this challenge, her kindness and strength wasn't going to be enough without a little luck. Once more, a dungeon exposed Mango's small PP problems. Out of rock tombs and faced with the evil smirk of the ever so feared Dusclops, I had to burn a Lepa Berry to preserve Mango's life. Maybe surprisingly, Mango was able to smack nearly the entirety of the rock tunnel trainers and walked out with exactly one PP left on rock tomb and none on any move elsewhere. Once in Lavender, we had to take on our rival immediately. Pokemon Tower is a unique dungeon in this game. The rival fight here is only interesting if you do it immediately, so by rule, we have to enter the tower now. That said, the tower needs to be re-entered in order to progress in the game after grabbing the Sylph scope from the game corner. The rule here is that we're allowed to clear as much of the upstairs as we want on both run-ins, but we can only enter exactly twice. Of course, the healing pad was banned and so was the item in the middle of it, but there was some extra flexibility in this dungeon that I couldn't help but be happy about. After nearly stomping the whole tower, we headed back outside to fight trainers north, south, and west of Lavender. With tons of XP to go around, we entered the game corner with Mango at a soaring level 59. Game corner quirks are a little bit weird. Technically, the trainers in here stay after Geo is defeated, but Mango completed most trainers before heading into the four mandatory fights in the Key Holder, the Door Grunts, and Giovanni himself. Beating Geo, we were left with only one move and opted to spare ourselves the trouble of healing PP to knock out just a couple more trainers. We left and headed back to Lavender to complete the tower. There were a couple trainers left there for us to beat up, which went fine. I'm pretty sure Mango is growing to like all of this destruction. It was around this point that I'd realized that Ironmon is just a reenactment of every 13 year old's first playthrough of Pokemon where only their starter mattered and even if they caught other Pokemon, they would just sit in the back of their party the whole time. Mango was all I ever needed anyways. She was able to defeat every single trainer in Pokemon Tower before the flute guy guided us out of the dungeon. Now, more over leveling. This portion of the game is crazy with trainers. We're able to clear everything east and west of Fuchsia, including the long bridge route and the biker path. All this had to be done before taking on our next gauntlet in Erica's gym. The thing is, delaying gyms as long as possible was always ideal. We needed to be over leveled in order to take on some of the later gyms who find themselves littered with extra trainers. I mean, Erica's gym has seven trainers before we're able to take on the actual gym leader herself. Being level 72 was hopefully going to help, but this gym was a lot for a Pokemon with only 35 PP. Seven trainers thumped, Mango walked into Erica at near full health. Blazikin fell. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say Blizzikin. As did the ensuing Tyranitar and Senecruel. Rapidash didn't stand a chance, and neither did Weezing or Camera. We cleared the Savari Zone of its wealth of items and geared up for Koga's gym. Once more, a gajillion trainers led into Koga, except now the levels were starting to catch up. Dealing with level 20s in Misty's and Surge's gym was easy. 30s in Erika's gym wasn't too hard either. Koga's level 40s and 50s were taking multiple hits to beat each and every Pokemon. Once to Koga, Mango was sitting at a meek 93 HP. With plenty of heals to burn, though, I felt good about our ability to get through this one. Swalot was a pain, eventually conceding to Sky Uppercut. The next Pokemon out, Ampharos, spooked the heck out of me by using Skill Swap. I hadn't seen an electric move all game, but I assumed that meant the opponents could see my ability. Now, I had a weakness to all electric moves for the rest of the fight. Gorobus came out and paralyzed Mango, getting multiple fully paralyzed turns before I was able to retaliate. Jinx wasn't super difficult next, but the Pokemon after was the 600 base stat Behemoth, Dragonite. It fired off two iron defenses before Mango was able to hit a Sleep Powder. Dragonite woke up immediately and fired off another Iron Defense. We were looking in bad shape. Thank you. Just crit easy, I'm working on it. Dude. What a gift. Intimidate Miltank, Koga's final Pokemon, took two hits to knock out, but the battle was won. Mango's adorableness had carried her past five gyms, and the story wasn't close to ending. 
With Surf now an option, Mango took to the seven seas to explore new areas of the map like the power plant and squish swimmers and divers alike en route to the Seafoam Islands, another trainerless item field that served as a basic boost in our assets. The penultimate dungeon was the Pokemon Mansion, a dungeon with approximately six high-level trainers and plenty of fun items to grab. It was a less than complicated full clear as the level 80 Mango was just too juicy for this one. Overwhelmed with citrus, we closed the Pokemon Mansion for good and headed for Blaine. Are Mango citrus See, I don't, I don't know. Anyways, Blaine's gym was a demon of a time. Every Pokemon is a super high level and there's like 10 trainers. Halfway through, Mango was burned by a flame wheel slow king, costing us a burn heal in the next battle. I did pop a PP up on Sky Uppercut, giving us three more moves to work with. Mango thrashed her way to Blaine, and the battle began against a very defensive Wailord. 20 levels under, Wailord was a three shot to knock out from full health with our strongest move. Mango squashed the oncoming Shuckle and Yanma, as well as the super speedy Drought Seviper. Porygon 2 showed no resistance to Mango's wrath, and a final wall rain succumbed to a blistering sky uppercut. We stopped in the fighting dojo to face off against five relatively easy to deal with random trainers. Most everyone brought less than three Pokemon to their fights, making PP management rather tolerable. There was just one small issue. The final dojo man brought a Mistrevis. Remember, Mango's only attacking move that can touch this thing is Rock Tomb, and I have no other means of inflicting damage. Mistrevis was evidently pretty defensive bulky off the jump. The randomized game also gifted it Barrier, which raised its defense by two stages in one turn. And the rest of its moveset? A very weak Aerial Ace, Pin Missile, and Reflect. Mistrevis stalled Mango out of Rock Tombs, forcing us to make a decision. Either we could ask Mango to burn a PP heal like an Aether or an Elixir, which we were already in short supply of, or we could use every move we have in an effort to run out and use Struggle, a typeless move that would guarantee a kill from 1 HP. The problem was that it worked. Mistrevis fainted from Struggle, and the matchup was won. The problem was that this interaction caused a Stantler to come out, and I forgot about Recoil. With our backs against the wall, Mango and I settled on feeding her an Energy Root, which she hated the taste of, but it gave her enough HP to eat another chunk of Recoil. Ironically, we would have lived without the Root, but six badges into a challenge that has lasted longer than the Grey's Anatomy franchise, I wasn't going to risk it. Sylphco was probably the hardest dungeon in the game. There were a few mandatory fights, and you have to gauge whether or not you're able to leave the building before battling Geo, as every optional trainer that would be worth grinding for experience leaves immediately after defeating Geo. With this in mind, I paved our way to the man first, taking on the mandatory rival battle as soon as I could. The opening spin has stood no chance, and the ensuing pile of swine couldn't deal with the sky upper crit. Mighty Enna boomed after putting Mango to sleep with Spore, and the two Manectrics in our rival's pocket stood no chance against countering our favorite Chunky Tortoise. We spent a little bit of time grinding grunts, but our small PP problems halted our progress rather quickly. We headed into Geo with only two Dizzy Punches, two Rock Tombs, and six Sky Uppercuts. Geo's opener was Sharpedo, who sucked. So did the Apom that came out next, and the Mr. Mime that dropped after that. Rock Tomb missed Flareon as it used Eruption, but Dizzy Punch knocked out both Flareon and Claydol with ease. The final Pokemon was a Peenseer, who was stocked with Intimidate and Incredible Defense. After Rock Tomb did less than half of its HP, Mango used Sleep Powder and started Sky Uppercutting. As long as Geo doesn't heal, which Geo never heals, right? Geo doesn't heal. Okay, so here's the situation. Pinsir understands that it sees a kill right now with one Comet Punch, which means it's guaranteed to Comet Punch. It never sees a kill with Endeavor, which means it's never going to Endeavor. So this turn is always Comet Punch. I know that. The problem is, I'm guaranteed to get out if I heal here with anything. Do I have any heals that aren't like my massive heals or do I literally have to use the hyper potion that I just got? Sick. With Mango's life on the line, I opted to heal. Peenseer used Mud Shot, Mango used Sky Uppercut, and the battle was won. Mango and I weren't sweating at all. I think it's fair to say at this point in the game that I was a little attached, but on to Sabrina. Sabrina's trainers weren't super tough. Mango did have to burn an Aether on Rock Tomb after missing a hit on Gengar, but heading into the final fight with over half of our HP felt a little comfy. Sabrina opened with a frail Sceptile that kicked rocks. Poliwrath melted, and though Heracross took two hits, the bug didn't do any damage either. But net collapsed, Volbeat failed to deal with a rock tomb, as did Rapidash. Sabrina was over in the blink of an eye. The final gauntlet awaited us. Giovanni's gym was notoriously difficult with an influx of high levels and a variety of regular and ace trainers. Having as many heals as we had felt reasonable, though I was definitely still on edge about this one. Geo's trainers were as tough as advertised. We entered the final battle with 60 HP and a dream. Mango slept the Gorbis on the open and fired off a super potion and an energy powder. Capitalizing on the small heals that we had acquired outside of the Elite Four felt like a good thing, and Mango was able to do it whilst knocking out the 
fish before it could even wake up. Polyrath found the same fate as did Furret. Mantine set up a defense curl, which I thought was spooky, but... All right, I'm actually gonna sleep powder this guy. And we're gonna try and rock tomb it now. I need to know exactly what I'm up against. Yeah, can you just stay asleep, Mantine? Thank you for hitting, finally. Oh, this thing has no defense. <laughs> that thing has less defense than a Blissey. Lapras fell and the final guard of wire couldn't handle Mango. Eight badges in and an elite four trip on the line. We just had to thump our rival to get there. Our rival opened with an Alakazam, followed up by a speedy Sunflora. Machamp dissipated, Relicanth dropped, and the final Manectric wasn't a bother either. The amount of sweeping our friend Mango was doing was absolutely absurd, even with our level advantage. Checks are usually scattered and relevant. I guess Gengar appeared recently, but Mango was cruising. The general rule with Victory Road is that battling the trainers here it just isn't worth it. They're too strong with high levels and many Pokemon. Still, I wanted to see if I could grind out one more level to sit at a convincing level 93 entering the league. After socking an ace trainer and a whole bunch of not ace trainers, Mango finally eclipsed level 90. We had two rare candies in the pocket, which we punched in to bring us to our ultimate level. For context, the highest level we'll be facing in the final test will be our champion's ace at level 95. Mango here was unironically not overleveled, and the final hurdle awaited us. Through seven dungeons, 10 gauntlets, and a whole lot of so close moments, Mango proved too tough, too brave, and too proud to go down. Would Mango be capable of winning it all? Lorelei was first, opening with a camera up. We burned three sky uppercuts on the camel after Lorelei healed, but at least the hyper potion was out of the way. Steelix was ironically not super defense bulky, and the Tangela that came in next took an uppercut miss and two hits to finish. Did Mango also miss Rock Tomb on the ace Farfetch'd? Did Farfetch'd actually have so much defensive bulk? Bullbeat stepped in next to fall to two rock tombs in its sleep, and the final Flareon with no defense sputtered out of commission just the same. Damageless Lorelei. Bruno stepped up to the plate to try and end this run, so what did his team look like? Cloyster dealt us our first instant of damage with its rock slide, and a speedy x Cloud built up its defense and collected three punches with Sky Uppercut before falling. All of this PP usage was certainly a bummer considering our ongoing PP problems, but if there was a time to burn elixirs, this was probably it. I wasn't worried. My Wheelay, dude? Oh! Oh! Take that, Mawile! Ma, ma, trash! Mama garbage, get crit hit, dummy! I told you guys, trash talking always gets crits. Kecleon was able to sneak in a magical leaf after surviving with hardly any HP and fell to a second hit. I BM'd Girafari with two rock tombs and had to eat a couple plus one secret powers from Huntail. It did paralyze Mango twice, but the big blue turtle prevailed in the end by sleeping it and using three separate attacks. Bruno was behind us. Our 322 attack stat was looking pretty and our PP situation was still very reasonable. Agatha opened with a weird looking snail that rock tomb into Sky Apricot handily dealt with. The jinx that came in next Next set up Drought, which was a little stressful because of the sun boosted solar beam potential, but E Speed Jinx had no chance of harming us. Mango healed and flexed its newfound perfect HP and PP by sleeping the opponent and obliterating it. Executor came in next, which was pretty spooky given the sun situation, but we buried it with three dizzy punches. Sleep Powder was putting in incredible amounts of work here, and I couldn't be more grateful. We treated the rest of the team the same, with Sleep Powders for good measure, followed by super hard hitting attacks. Noctowl dropped. Cloyster fell, Espeon fell, and the battle was over. Mango was on to Lance. Lance opened with Octillery, which shouldn't have been this scary. Yeah, Lance more like pants. Oh, oh, oh no. I don't like that at all. Please, oh no. Please hit. Well, that was the worst first turn I could have possibly had. After healing, Octillery was unable to eat a sky upper crit and the beefy whale of Christmas present stepped in to ruin my dreams, setting up withdrawals like no other. The good news here is that items are allowed in battle, meaning the X accuracy and X attacks I was able to take advantage of were able to significantly impact this fight. Chipping the beast down was painful, though about five sky uppercuts nearly killed it and it healed. I used this opportunity to heal Mango's PP and HP once more and knocked it out with a final sky uppercut. Vaporeon came out next. Fun fact about Vaporeon, did you know that it's unable to withstand multiple hits from our dear friend Mango here? And then Latias entered the fight. Uh, Thunder? Dude, no freaking way. Well, that was the worst first turn ever. No way! Okay, alright, that's fine. I can live with that. I just, I want to kill it. Yes! 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 Oh, the only electric moves that's been used on me!
literally all game, I haven't seen one electric move this whole game. And I finally get it off of a metronome. Latios, dude. GG's. Thank you very much. Good night, Houndoom. Adios. Sayonara. Whatever else. Riva Darche, I don't know. I I don't even I I don't. Uh, this thing's paper defense. I've killed it every single time I've touched it. I'm plus one. I should beat this. Thank you. Good night. Only the champion remained. Mango, my friend, my companion. Take care of business. With a Smeargle opener, we officially had the best Pokemon to set up on in the game. 250 base stat total was garbage. We tossed in almost all of our X items, including accuracies, attacks, defends, speeds, and so on. I healed our friend Mango, used the final X speed, and the ceremony was underway. Okay. This is what it is. Okay. Kecleon dies. Kecleon got sent out because it has Magical Leaf, that's it. Wow, the HP on that thing is crazy. I'm gonna mark it as plus speed, I'm a little nervous about it. Oh, this thing actually, unironically, I think survives one. But it's very slow. Dude, that was a crit. Man, this thing is crazy. This thing is just defense, which is hilarious. That was, that was crazy. All right, I, I dizzy punch here, I think. no speed it's literally just defense remind me to look up what this electabuzz is because that's crazy one more left it's manectric the ace of all aces manectric kaizo ironmon just one final pokemon to beat oh guys i think it's only right we win with rock tomb Rock Tomb finished the job. Yes! 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 It's over! It's done! Kaizo Ironmon! Complete, dude! Yes! The mango that could! Bro, VA Blastoise! 1600 attempts later. Mango did it! Thank you guys for being here. I appreciate it. Oh, man.